Good evening, everybody. We're really glad to see you. The meeting tonight is sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Brookhaven. And we're here tonight, and, we, and we've left some literature at the back that we hope you'll take and enjoy. We are a nonpartisan organization. We don't support any candidates ever, but we are political in the sense that we encourage people to register and vote and to inform themselves about the candidates they're going to be voting for. So that's why we're here, so you're going to get a chance to meet the candidates before you vote. And you, we're going to hear from two candidates for mayor for, for Port Jefferson Village and three candidates for the two trustee seats. <clears throat> and the election, as you know, will be June 15th. So we ask you to silence your phones. The debate will be streamed in its entirety, so no one should be recording it. We will not be taking questions from the floor. All questions will come from the cards that you submit. Our betting committee here is looking them over to make sure they're fair and they cover a variety of issues. If you haven't submitted a card and would like to, please get a card from Joan or from Reagan. Each of the candidates will make an opening statement of two minutes. Each candidate <coughs> will then have a chance to answer the questions that have been submitted, or some of them, there are a great many. They will have one minute to answer each question. Each candidate will be able to rebut a statement made by another candidate by holding up his red card, but we have pink cards, and they will have a minute to make their statement. They can do this five times. The person receiving the rebuttal may respond for one minute. At 8.15, if all the questions have been answered, or if all the questions have been answered, I will call on the candidates to give their closing statements, beginning with the candidate who made the last opening statement. Each candidate will have two minutes. So we'll begin now with the opening statements, beginning with... <laughs> beginning with Barbara Ransom. <laughs> Hello. Oh. Yes, thank you. All right. Well, good evening, Port Jefferson residents and friends and colleagues. Thank you, the League of Women Voters, for hosting this debate tonight. I'm here to shine a new light to our village, one that's transparent, all-inclusive, and balanced. My time has come to take on the leadership role of our wonderful village. Time for change time for new perspectives, and time for fresh eyes. I believe there's a strong sense in our community of needed change with our current leadership, and I have the confidence that I can be that change. Most of you, I hope, um, if not all, know me. And I've been involved with this community for 37 years. My roots are deep, and yes, experience does matter, as reflected my service over self. We did have a Port Jefferson um, Association, a civic association, and I want to know I was there for nine years and president for five. Past Port Jefferson trustee and deputy mayor for 12 years, member for 25 years now, and director of operations for the Greater Port Jefferson Chamber of Commerce for 10 years. So I have a real understanding and balance of public and private entities. I was honored by my commitment to the Charles Dickens Festival in 2013, president of the Sawasset Garden Club, so I'm a little warm and fluffy, project manager for the build-out of the Chandlery, and I'm moving right along. Having a balance between residential and our business district is essential for our commitments, for our communities, and health and well-being. I have a proven track record in getting things done and hardworking, and I'm always going to be accessible. I will support initiatives that encourage open lines of communication, strategize to improve our building and planning process so it's fluid and our residents can enjoy, so the residents can enjoy our village. I will foster a safe environment for this and be a full-time mayor. And I'm going to stop right there. Thank you. Yes, I'm waiting for Frida. Ready? Okay. Thanks, uh, League of Women Voters and everybody for attending this evening. 
After being sick with COVID in late December, I finally had the opportunity in early January to speak with my executive team and make the careful decision about running for another term. Mind you, at that time, there were no vaccinations available. We were still closed for business, and the budget for the village was approximately 1.2 million short due to lack of programs and declined revenue lines. <clears throat> Only halfway through the fiscal year, I don't think it was time to step away from my 12 years of service or leave the village in an uncertain and unstable condition with the unknown still ahead for the next five months and beyond. Here we are now, almost to the other side of this pandemic, hoping that as summer wanes, we continue to maintain a strong sense of place and fiscal stability into 2022. So it wasn't a surprise that Team Unity felt it was the right thing to do to stick together and to run another term. Now we continue to work on the projects that we had started in 2019 when we were united and stronger than ever, partnering with our schools to celebrate the best homecoming event I can remember since my days at Port Jeff High and co-sponsoring a new and successful winter ice festival with our business improvement district. We all got gypped and suffered tremendous losses throughout the horrible year of 2020. Through it all, we kept our village staff working safely with no layoffs and maintained our services throughout the village. In fact, we didn't miss a beat, and I am proud of leading us through those dark and uncertain days. You'll learn tonight that Stan, Kathy Ann, and I have very different and distinct roles in village government, and each bring our unique assets to the table. We work really well together in our diverse representation of these different areas of our village. My leadership style has been to have an open door and make decisions by building consensus. We don't always agree, but I respect your opinions and input as we are all neighbors one community, and we will always find a way to go forward together. This election is not about me, and it's not about my opponent. It's about you, and it's about this village. Every day and in every decision I have made, I have used the guiding principle to do that, which is only in the best interest of this village. I look forward to the continuing the debate. Thank you. Okay. I just want to let the candidates know, thank you, that Rita in the front will hold up cards telling you how much time you have left and when your time is up. Thank you. So we'll move on to the trustees. We'll start with Mr. Lokes. And my name is uh, Stan Lokes. Lokes, sorry. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> uh, my wife and family moved into this village 41 years ago. For 34 years, I was employed as an educator and an athletic director in a large school district in Nassau County. I managed over 100 athletic programs and administered a $20 million budget. I have been involved in Port Jefferson since 1978. That year, I became president of the tennis club. The following year, I became president of the golf club. Shortly after that, I became a member of the CCMAC, which is the Country Club Management Advisory Committee. And for the past six years, I have been your trustee in charge of or working with your Parks Department, your Village Center, the Recreation Department, and the Country Club. I've been a liaison to this department and work very closely with all of the department heads and staff to ensure that all of our parks, beaches, recreation, time is up. I didn't get a 30 second. No, but you have a little bit more I to only say. Have a minute. I thought we had two minutes. You do have two minutes, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Rita, you give him two minutes, right? No, he's not answering. On a monthly basis. I am omnipresent on social media. I am there every day to answer your questions real time. I've worked very hard to make Port Jefferson the place that you want to live, work, and raise your children. I'm not perfect, but I'm always willing to listen, pivot, and adapt. I'm not finished yet. I am just getting started. I'm Kathy Ann Snaden, and I'm running to be reelected as your village trustee. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Suzanne Blasquez. 
I have been your neighbor for 17 years, along with my husband, Stephen, and our daughter, Veronique, a graduating senior from our high school this year. And throughout all of these years, I have been more than just your neighbor, as an active volunteer member of our community, with the school, the Historical Society, the Daughters of the American Revolution, various service organizations, events and activities, and as a director and past president of the Greater Port Jefferson Chamber of Commerce. My professional career has been in ethical public service as an educator and administrator and as a licensed clinical social worker. I'm also a small business owner with my professional practice of public health and wellness promotion and am a property owner in the village. I have a lot of experience in resource and grants management, project development and efficiency improvements and effective leadership. As a professional problem solver, my skill set is anchored in developing positive working relationships, implementing holistic critical thinking and decision making, fostering inclusion of diverse ideas, and implementing innovative solutions. I offer both experience and a fresh perspective for our village government by bringing the voices of all the various segments of our community and advocating for Port Jefferson to be and thrive as a healthy community for all. So why am I ser running to serve as your village trustee? We are at a critical moment for our village governance, particularly as we embark into a post-pandemic times. I'm concerned about the increased density and the decreased attention and amenities for our taxpayers. As a licensed healthcare provider, I want to see Port Jefferson continue to thrive as a healthy community, and I bring a set of professional skills and experience as an ethical, hardworking public servant to facilitate and improve the quality of life for us as residents of Port Jefferson Village. I ask for your vote on June 15th for row B, the Alliance for All team. Thank you. Okay, when we do the questions, we'll just go down the list, the line. Yes. Pardon me? Oh. With readers ready? Oh. <laughs> okay. That's the hardest job, absolutely. And Rita was wonderful to agree to do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, what we'll do with the questions is just go down the list, the row, not that, not separating mayor and trustees, and then we'll go back each time so that we rotate. One minute. Okay. All right. So, the first question, the first question actually is for Maya Garant and Barbara Ransom, and that is, in your tenure as director of the chamber and as mayor, what have you done to bring business to Uptown Fort Jefferson? So you could start. I, can, can you repeat the question? Because I didn't quite hear it. Okay. When as, go ahead. All right. In your tenure as director of the chamber and as mayor, what have you done to bring business to Uptown Port Jefferson? Well, I'm not mayor yet, but I guess that will be um, well, directed to Margo, right? No, we're, we're, it says as director of the chamber and as mayor. So we'll start with Mayor Garant and then you can answer. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> ready, Rita? You ready, Rita? Okay, I'm over here. I'm right here. Ready? Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Um, I've been mayor now 12 years, and as everybody knows, Uptown is a very uh, challenged business improvement district. Uh, we did the master plan, the revitalization plan, the blight study, and the revitalization study. Uh, selected a master developer, and as of a few weeks ago, you see uh, the Hills Project was built first, and then we have Conifer 1 with a shovel in the ground, negotiating a Conifer 2 to put another shovel in the ground. Um, the entire uptown has to be redeveloped, and the only way you get redevelopment there is you put a bunch of properties together, you get a developer, and he will build housing and more feet on the street, more people living there will make for a safer neighborhood and make for a demand for new businesses. As of about three months ago, <clears throat> we do have a new business up there, an upholsterer. Towers is doing pretty well last time I checked. Um, but, you know, we definitely need help uptown, and in the days of big box Amazon and after a pandemic, uh, I think the best thing we can do is move forward with the master plan and, and building more buildings, with mixed use with retail on the main floor. Thank you. Uh, 
Okay, the, um, the chamber membership has in increased at least 50% since I've been director of operations. So we have shown that we are vital and uh, a very important organization to join. So businesses reach out to us. We hold events that bring in um, a lot of people to come into the village. We encourage participation from Stony Brook University. So we are always looking for new businesses. We've done our own personal reach out to certain land um, property owners, landlords, to encourage them to try to get different types of commerce, particularly in um, Upper Port. So we've always had a line of communication to try to encourage um, businesses to come down into the village as well in Upper Port. Thank you. Okay, the next question is, uh, is for everybody. What is your opinion about prohibiting or allowing dispensaries and marijuana smoking lounges in the village? And we'll start with Mr. Laux. You got me? Uh, the question no, don't was... Don't have to answer it. I mean, it's, not, it's not required that you answer. No, I'm going to answer the question. Okay. I do not believe we should have any facilities within the village that allows the smoking of any of those substances or the ingestion of any of those substances anywhere in the village. Uh, we recently passed a code forbidding it in all of the owned properties of the village. For example, inside this building, on this property, in any of our parks, in the village. Thank you. Okay. Pursuant to uh, Governor Cuomo's uh, new legislation to allow cannabis to be uh, either ingested or smoked or dispensaries to operate, uh, we have up until the end of the year to opt out of allowing any kind of uh, cannabis dispensary to be allowed within the village. We cannot by law uh, have them totally not in our village like we did with the vape shops, which this board did. <clears throat> we uh, limited them to the light industrial zone, which is up on Columbia. There are two lots there. You cannot restrict it entirely. You have to regulate it to a certain zone. I myself have not made a decision on this because I think it's a tough decision. Cannabis dispensaries are clean, they're safe. Uh, people are going to go to other places and purchase it and come back. Um, I think it might be an incentive for uptown redevelopment. Uh, so I have not closed the door on this and I'd like to hear more from my community before I make that final decision come the new year. Thank you. Thank you. When I first heard that this law had been passed, the first thing I wanted to do was learn about it and find out as much as I could about what, was, what could potentially come, what the effects would be, what the fallout could be. Uh, one of the things I did was jump on a phone call with uh, the state um, where they educated us on exactly you know, what the law was, how it would affect um, a small village like us. We asked questions, um, and since then I've been doing a lot of reading and research. I haven't made a final decision. Um, if I had to give an answer, yay or nay, tonight, I would say I would, I'm against it. Um, it's always, you know, err on the side of caution right now. Um, but as we move forward, as the mayor said, it could be an opportunity for uptown. There is tax implications there where we would receive tax revenue. Um, but as the commissioner of public safety, um, I have a lot of concerns. Um, as the mayor said, you know, we're not going to be able to prevent people from using it um, in public areas other than the parks, which we already did. Thank you. Okay. Well, we haven't quite... Okay. It is considered legal. If you're 21, you are allowed to smoke um, marijuana. We haven't um, quite made the decision yet in regards to if we want to have these types of dispensers here in the village. Like, we don't particularly like tattoo parlors, so they can go into our different zone. But in the C1 and the C2 district, I would have some reservations of having that type of a store here in the village. But it should be, if we're going to use 
all our parks, all public property that government owns, it should be excluded throughout and not just limited to um, everything. So I'm saying that like on the golf course, it should not be able to smoke on the golf course either. Um, when they passed the other night, the golf course was excluded, so people could still smoke on the golf course, but if we're gonna be even playing, we should in fact have um, no smoking out there of any sorts, including cigarette smoking, and also around our parks. So um, I would say that we have to keep looking into this. It is something that's going to be evolving. It is legal in New York State, and it could be of great revenue producing. Okay, Mr. Lox has a, a red card. I uh, have a rebuttal for that uh, comment about the golf course. Uh, yeah. Yes, one minute. We, we have discussed this through the CCMAC. Uh, there is no way that we can not abide by the code that was passed by the village. Uh, membership will be informed. There will be no smoking on the golf course or in any of the area around the golf course. It's going to be a difficult process to enforce it, but it will be announced and it will be put in place. Barbara, you have a card? Okay. No, Margo. <laughs> sorry. Just Mayor. <laughs> Kevin? Oh, sorry. Just a clarification. The village passed a code which, may, which prohibits the use or smoking of tobacco or cannabis products on any village owned property whether it's Village Hall, Village Center, the park, Harborfront Park, Rocket Ship Park, we omitted the country club from that code resolution because as we know, when you are on the golf course in the open space, some of the ladies and gentlemen like to enjoy a cigar. And so if we cannot enforce one type of tobacco, it's difficult to then enforce another type of tobacco. So we are looking to make it a policy of membership when you join the country club to prohibit the use of cannabis as a policy when you become a member. I just want to clarify that point. Thank you. Ms. Ransom, do you want to answer? I'd like to answer the original no, Barbara, question. Barbara, I'm, I'm asking Barbara Ransom if she wants to answer the rebuttals. I think that's privilege. I think that, in fact, if you're going to allow people not to have, you can't smoke on um, government property, village property, that includes our parks, that includes our golf course. It shouldn't be a, a policy. It should be an even playing um, regulation. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Ms. Velasquez, you go. So would you repeat the original question? Yeah, oh, sure. <laughs> it's about opting out of I, I dispensary? Okay. Um, what is your opinion about having dispensaries or, what was the rest of the question? Sorry. That's okay. Um, I am, you know, it is a difficult uh, topic. I am against having dispensaries of uh, marijuana in the lower portion of the village, particularly because our high school and our middle schools um, are at the center of our downtown area. As Mayor M Margo um, Grant mentioned, we do need to look at the zoning and, and regulate it by zoning because it is um, a right for adults at being a legal, legal um, issue. I am, again, as a healthcare provider, I'm against um, marijuana and with the exception of medical marijuana in pill or liquid form. I think that the benefits from um, smoking any type of uh, product, tobacco or cannabis, um, is unhealthy. And the benefits um, don't add up. Thank you. Okay. The, the next question, uh, Ms. Velasquez, you will answer first? Sure. No, she will. When? Suzanne? Sure. Okay. Uh, now that there's an agreement with regards to the <clears throat> power plant, what do you think should be done with that site? Um, I think that we should be looking forward to how can we um, 
leverage the site, the location, the services to explore green energy um, opportunities to, to bring renewable energy to our village, um, to even power the village unto itself um, for village facilities. Well, we've entered into a glide path um, as far as payments to the village, so we are um, at least under control with the financial obligation that we are going to have to have with the power plant. I hope that it still stays there. Um, I wouldn't want it to be, have it to be dissolved. Um, we should always constantly be looking into green energy. We have wind power farms that are going to be encroaching in us um, sooner or later. We have the Obsted or Orsted um, coming in um, and their maintenance and their administration offices here are right here in Setauket. We are a working harbor, so we have to continue to look for um, clean and green energy. I'm fully in favor of, of working uh, towards repurposing and repowering that plant. I'm in favor of green energy um, and doing what we can to, uh, to sustain that property in the best way possible. Um, to date, it hasn't been my department, um, but I, that's my opinion if it ever becomes my department and anything that is brought to me by those, uh, the fellow trustees and mayor that are working on that, um, I am fully on board to uh, become more and more educated about the topic and, uh, you know, and help out in any way that I can. Um, I'm, I'm on board with however it can be repurposed to help the village in a responsible way. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The uh, current agreement is a settlement to the tax certiorari case, and we built a glide path for this community, which gave, gave us stability through the purchase power agreement through 2027. Uh, we had a Me Too clause in there, so if any of the other communities, such as Huntington recently, had a better settlement, we would get a second bite of the apple, as we just did. And I put that money towards the next three years to create further stability for this community. Um, I'm in full conversation with the LIPA organization. Um, the executive team there um, just had a Zoom meeting with them last week. Uh, they are going to be doing another integrated resource plan, which is a study of the demand for energy on this island. And through New York State, everybody wants to drive electric cars. We're building solar farms, solar panels. Um, so we're hoping that the demand for energy increases, and uh, we are looking at alternate uses of hydrogen for, as an example. We will repurpose this site. I'm committed to doing that. And although we are building wind farms, which are fantastic for jobs and for green, it also creates instability in the, in the power grid. When the wind doesn't blow, you need a fast alternate source of energy. I want to thank Trustee Miller for his help and the assistance on this project through the many years. The buzzer, the buzzer is a good end to the, to the time. Don't worry about I believe that fossil fuel should be something of the past. Uh, there will no longer be any fossil fuel taking place over at that plant. I know that Trustee Miller and uh, Mayor Garant have been working very, very close with the people who are in charge of that plant over there. We're looking to bring in alternate sources of energy. Um, they're very difficult people to deal with, but we are making some progress thanks to the Mayor and Trustee Miller. How important is the water quality in Port Jefferson Harbor, and is the village involved at the level that is required? If, if there's a question that a trustee doesn't need to answer, I mean, don't feel you have to answer everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're having problems hearing you. Could you speak into the mic better, please, Nancy? Pardon me? Uh, we're having problems hearing you. Could you speak clearer into the mic, okay. possibly? <clears throat> All right. Thank you. How important is the water quality in Port Jefferson Harbor? Is the village involved at the level that is required? Stan, you. So I'd like to answer that question. Uh, water quality of the harbor is extremely important to this community. We are mandated by DEC to have a, uh, a uh, environmental uh, study done every year, a storm water quality runoff study. Uh, we have a consultant that we hire. We are required to do training every year. Uh, we take samples of the outfall pipes as they enter into the harbor. We were taking tests of nitrogen and making sure that the harbor is at its cleanest. We did notice that in the summertime when everybody's offloading their boats that we had a nitrogen problem in the water. 
Um, but I know that we have good friends in Setauket who are also equally uh, concerned about the, the water quality, and the Board of Trustees is committed to working with DEC, the state organizations, um, to make sure our, our harbor is uh, clean, and I believe it came out in the recent results as being one of the cleanest watersheds on the North Shore. I, I just want to say, uh, of course, water quality is important. Um, why would we not want to think that? Um, we've we've, we've reinstituted having um, oysters um, growing in our harbor right now because our, we've improved our water quality. It's very important, and we constantly need to monitor um, all the sewage that we have in this area and make sure that we're testing it frequently so that we have excellent water quality. Ms. Naden. I do think it's very important as well. I've attended all of the, the trainings that the mayor had, uh, had uh, mentioned. And uh, one of the things I, I wanted to do when I heard about the increase in contaminants uh, when there is the offloading of the boats in the high season um, was uh, similar to my See Something, Say Something campaign. Uh, we need to reach the boaters and explain to them and educate them on what that offloading is, is doing and what it, the problems it's causing uh, here in the harbor. Um, I like to get in front of an issue and get in front of a problem and prevent it before it happens. So that would be um, what I would do to help with that problem. Thank you. Ms. Velasquez. As my colleague said, the water quality is important definitely in the harbor um, for our environment, oh, ecosystems, but also, again, um, our entire water table on Long Island is important to keep safe and um, you know everything that we can do to maintain test and make sure that the wa water in our harbor and the water that's coming out of our faucets uh, are, is clean and quality needs to be done. Thank you. I would like to make a little comment about that. Sure. Uh, we are a village that is on the harbor. This harbor brings business to our village. If we look at the harbor in the high season, it is full of boats, and the, the, the water quality is extremely important because of the fact that we are on this harbor. Thank you. Okay, the next question starts at your end. What would you do to limit the loud music for many restaurants in the village? I think that music is wonderful to have in the in the village, and but we also need to be looking at noise order ordinances, and that plays into um, having a, a code enforcement bureau that um, pays uh, pays attention to noise violations that occur after um, late at night and into the early mornings. So um, I think that music at restaurants brings vitality, quality, liveliness to um, the experience. But again, we need to be paying attention to the noise violations of our code. We need to make sure that our code enforcement officers know how to operate the noise decimal equipment that we have. That means that if we get a complaint, they need to be able to go over there and measure how loud things are and then give out summonses. There are quality of life issues here in the village and we want everyone to be respected. And so therefore, if the noise is too loud, we need to ask them to turn it down and they have to be given fines if in fact they continue to play loud music. Music is nice, um, but you want to keep it somewhat to the confines of your own property line. So we do like um, live music as well, not just um, canned music, but we have to be respectful to our residents and to our other business neighbors. We do have a noise ordinance um, in our code book. We do have decibel readers. Our code officers are trained regularly on how to use those decibel readers. I personally have taken multiple phone calls throughout my last two years on things like noise. I immediately call the code officer and they immediately go down and speak to the business owner. 9.9% .9 of the time, the business owner is very respectful, appreciates the fact that the code officer came in, spoke to them personally, 
explain the situation and there's always that much of the time been cooperation. Um, I don't remember a time where um, there was a problem after our code officer being the ambassadors that they are and the good ambassadors and the good neighbors that they are um, that anybody then violated again. Um, I, I fully agree that the code needs to be followed. I love the music in the village. It makes it, you know, it's a very great place for people to come and enjoy, but, you know, we have to respect the residents um, and, and the time at which the music goes off. Thank you. Okay. So uh, we modified our code, in fact, taking into consideration the hours and days of operation of the restaurants and their desire to have outdoor music. So we had the uh, noise or the music stop earlier during the weekdays and a little bit later on the weekends um, to help you know, keep this village uh, open and operating uh, from, for a seasonal time only. Uh, the Code Enforcement Bureau does have noise meters, as does Danford's have their own noise meter because Really, it's Danford's at times that, are, that we got the most complaints about. Have to understand, Port Jeff Village, we are in a bowl here, and the way the, mu the music travels or the sound travels, we sometimes need your help to tell us at 10.30 at night that they're playing too loud. Code enforcement is on till 12 and now till 2 a.m., and Suffolk County Police are also on till 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. now with us, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, to help us enforce. So call us. I think the questions have been answered quite adequately. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Stan. <laughs> okay. The next question has to do with transportation. One part of it is what has happened to the bus shelters that have been removed? And the other is there were routes that had been installed to aid with new buildings that were being built. And will that be reinstated this year? What are your future plans for transportation? I'm sorry, Nancy, can you repeat the second half? Yeah. <coughs> um, I sort of, it says the, trans, the routes that had been installed to aid in new buildings being built, will they be reinstated this year? What about the bus shelters? I can answer the question about the bus shelters. I'm very unclear about the other part about the, yeah. the routes or the bus shelters. All right, well, at the, okay, I'll take the bus shelters. So last year we, um, unfortunately had to eliminate some of the bus shelters. Uh, the shuttle with Stony Brook University was no longer uh, in operation, and unfortunately during COVID, in, in particular the winter months, while in Uptown in particular, we had an incident where we had a homeless man using one of our bus shelters as a shelter. Um, down here, we found that there was a lot of graffiti going on and the, uh, the shelter on Arden. Um, this year, however, the, the uh, Stony Brook Jitney is coming back, and we were successful in getting Stony Brook University to actually contribute 50%, that's a lot of money, folks, 50% towards bringing the Stony Brook bus back to Port Jefferson. The village and the Business Improvement District hope to split the other portion of that expense, and maybe we'll see our bus shelters back when we have a bus. I don't know. The question is kind of vague. Um, uh, we sh we use Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, good. Go ahead. Yeah. Kathy, so, um, go next. The mayor answered uh, about the bus shelters. Um, the bus route, um, I've worked very hard uh, as liaison to our parking and transportation department to bring back that Stony Brook bus. Um, now that COVID is, uh, we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, I think it's very important for businesses to have uh, students, staff, and anybody else on that shuttle route come into the village to patronize the businesses and the restaurants without their vehicles. It's so important. Uh, so I, I have been um, on the parking committee even prior to being a trustee, and it's one of the things I'm passionate about is, is to making the parking uh, good for everyone, and, and one of the ways to do that, to bring people into the village with that shuttle, is to do it where they don't bring their cars. So um, as the mayor said, uh, because of the negotiations and the talks and the good relationship we've all developed with Stony Brook University, they have agreed to pay half the cost, which was one of the stumbling blocks of bringing that, that shuttle back. So I'm very happy with that. Thank you. Thank you. There, there's not a lot to add to that, except that certainly the collaboration that we have with Stony Brook University is very important. We are an intermodal transportation village. We have a ferry, we have the trains, we have buses, and of course we have cars. So the more that we can try to encourage alternate um, uses of transportation, I certainly would support and bringing in the bus shelters when in fact we start 
the shuttle to come back to um, the village uh, would be important. Thank you. Yeah. I think um, an issue is that not only the bus shelters were removed, but also the benches at the train station and throughout um, th for the, at, the bus at the bus stops. And I think it's, we did a real like disservice to the people that um, may have uh, ability issues, just want to sit and take a rest, or have to wait for a bus that they can't sit, sit because um, there, the, there's been a selectivity as to who we, want, we feel is valid in being able to use benches and uh, shelters. I think that um, you know we we should make sure that we have places for people to sit. The seniors, um, disabled, just people wanting to enjoy. Um, and I think that it's um, we should have bus shelters and um, benches at the train station for everybody to use and not just um, select who, who should be allowed to rest in, in a healthy way. Thank you. Okay, now the next question. Yeah, we have a rebuttal from Aunt Ms. Naden. Thank you. <laughs> um, the reason the benches were removed at the train station was because of the multitude of complaints that we received of crime, criminal activity going on on these benches, around these benches. It's not about selectivity. We do not discriminate as to who can sit and who can rest. We welcome everyone to this village and we help them in any way that we can. But we cannot have crime, we cannot have drug deals, we cannot have what was going on at the train station. I'm very proud to say that in my last two years as of trustee, one of the first things I took on was the crime at the train station. Um, in, in working with Pax Christie, one of the things that they had asked for was that we remove the benches. The train station, the MTA, asked that we remove the benches. We, that's what we do. We listen to the community around us. We listen to the commuters on the train, and this is what they wanted. It's what we did. I'm not against having a place for people to rest, but I am against crime in Uptown and at the train station. That's not the way to bring back business into Uptown. Thank you. Do you want to answer her? Oh, yes. Yeah. We are the only Long Island Railroad station that has removed benches. There are segmented benches available. There, the ability for somebody to, to rest or be seated, um, particularly while they're waiting for the transportation, we're encouraging people to use public transportation to, to alleviate the parking in our village and yet we don't allow them to be able to sit and wait for that pu public transportation schedule. Um, the code enforcement, you know, it, it's, it, there's options available that don't, I, I don't, I really don't see the correlation of a bench to crime. Okay, yeah, she has another, okay. Um, um. I do see the correlation of bench to crime because I've been up there. I've been at the train station with our code department, with our chief, and with our sergeant, and I've walked those tracks at one in the morning, at midnight, and I've seen what goes on on the benches. And again, it wasn't something that we just came in and said, let's take these benches away because we don't want people to be able to rest. We researched it, we talked to the MTA, we talked to Pax Christie, we talked to the commuters, and we talked to residents. And the overwhelming consensus was to remove the benches that were there. Now, I'm not against putting back another option, another way for people to rest. There is, it's not that there's no place to rest. The train station inside has plenty of benches and places to sit. So there is crime, there is crime on the benches. I've seen it with my own eyes while well, I've been there, and I, I've, I've listened to the community. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the next question. The next question begins with you. Uh, what is the village policy with oversized political signage on commercial properties? I don't know if you, if you know the answer as a trustee. No. Who gets the question? What 
What is the policy? Yes. I'm and what do you think the policy should be? Um, I think that uh, signage is a form of free speech. I think that that there should be some code as to sign and the um, possible language, you know, you don't want it offensive, um, but if it's on private property, it's on private property. Thank you. We, we do have um, on the code now, if you, it's not the, what's the narrative of what the sign says, but it is the size of the sign. There is rules and regulations that have to be followed. If it is on private property, they can be given a summons because it's the, the size of the sign, not necessarily what it says, provided it's not vulgar. So people do have First Amendment rights. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, we all have First Amendment rights, but we also have laws and we have codes and we have rules. I think I just said that. Excuse me, can I finish please? Go ahead, thank you. You're welcome. The rules have to be followed. The rules of our sign code are quite extensive. Um, I, I've researched them, I've looked them over, and it's one of the things that um, I'm, I'm working on with our village prosecutor and our um, inspectors is to look at that code and to possibly make changes that are necessary moving forward. However, the rules must be flat followed. If you want to put up a political sign or a sign of any message that you see fit, because you have the right to do so, do it within the confines of the code. Make sure the sign is attached to your building properly so it doesn't become a safety hazard. Make sure that it is of the right size and shape and go through the building and planning department. They're there for a reason. Request the permit, get the permit, and put up the sign saying whatever you wanna say. Thank you. Uh, the, village, the village sign code does not regulate what the sign says. It regulates the size of the sign, the way the sign is affixed to the building, the temporary nature of the sign, meaning the materials that it is made out of. Um, you do need a permit to hang your sign. Um, the one thing we also changed about the code was the order to remedy. It was prior, about two years ago, prior to that, it was 30 days the business owner would receive a violation, a notice of violation, they would have up to 30 days to remedy. We have now brought that down to five days to remedy. So if the sign does not come down within five days, you will now get a summons and you'll be called to court. The uh, fine is up to $2,000 per offense per day. No comment. Okay. All right, the next, the next question is, uh, what is the plan for additional security code enforcement during the late night hours? There have been many, many employees who get followed and harassed after their shift, and these are young adults who should not be too frightened to leave their jobs. You wanna answer that? I can start uh, to answer that question. We have Suffolk County, the whiskey, they call the whiskey department, they're coming in on weekends, uh, we're not going to give out the hours that they're going to be here, uh, but they're going to be present on our streets. Uh, they have a little bit more clout than our code officers. Uh, as you are aware, or maybe you're not, uh, our code officers are somewhat restricted with what they can do in terms of the laws that are being broken downtown. I can tell you that the code officers are usually the first ones there, and they certainly uh, are in constant contact with Suffolk County. Uh, we have been given extra coverage from Suffolk County for the summer months, and as I said before, uh, we're not going to advertise the times they are here for obvious reasons, but they will be here, and I'm sure Kathy Ann can expand upon it. She is our Commissioner in charge of our code department. Uh, my time is up. Thank you. Okay. Um, late night hours, our code enforcement bureau now is working till 2 a.m. Uh, during the uh, shorter season or the lighter season, they work till midnight. So they are on from 10 a.m. to 12 and now till 2 a.m. Our code enforcement officers are seasonal part-time employees. So they can only work 16 and a half hours per week. 
until we get relief from civil service, again, during the high season to expand their hours to 20 hours a pay period or per week. That enables us to extend their time to 2 a.m. They can't be everywhere all the time, folks. They have a lot of things they do. They tour your neighborhoods. They are down here helping actually save lives. They saved the life of a woman just the other night uh, using Narcan and uh, calling the ambulance. Um, they are doing a fantastic job of handling just daily routine occurrences. Um, and uh, I find that their response time is less than two minutes. And I think they are doing a better job for us than they ever have. So I can tell you some things that I am doing. Um, in fact, I was just at the 6th Precinct this morning speaking to Inspector Riley about uh, new and, and different ways we can enhance our whiskey tour that we have here in, in, uh, in, in the village through Suffolk County Police. Um, I want everybody to realize that for the extremely low crime rates and the size of our village, to have a dedicated team of Suffolk County Police here in our village is unheard of. And I know that because I speak to police all the time from different communities and different areas and even in, in other counties. They think that's unheard of. And the reason we have that is because of, of our fantastic and strong relationship with Suffolk County Police. Our code enforcement cannot arrest people and they don't have police power. So it's key that we have that relationship and I feel that we have that and it is strong. That we, uh, one of the steps that I'm taking moving forward um, and I have already taken steps to have a kiosk put up on Main Street in a very prominent locations for our code officers. So they will be available to anybody during their tour. Um, we have the dedicated Main Street officers that patrol Main Street up and down. Um, we also have the ambassadors that go into businesses. Thank you. I don't think it's a secret, but that the whiskey unit is supposed to be working from 3 p.m. to 3 a.m. What I don't quite understand is how come we can't have shifts that have our code people working until 4 a.m. That's when the problem really happens, okay? It's when the bars let out. Unfortunately, we can't control that. The bars let out at 4 a.m. in the morning, and that's when things will really happen. When we got our tax bills this year, we got this little card in there. It says that our code is there 365 days out of the year from 10 to midnight. Well, I'd like to know what happens from midnight to 10 a.m. in the next morning. I mean, do we all go to sleep? I think that we need to change our shifts on our codes so that they are working in conjunction with Suffolk County. Very pleased that this is like one of the first times Suffolk County actually has come out to have a two footman patrol to, uh, to walk around from again 3 p.m. to 3 a.m. in the morning. And the business community should know about this because they're the ones that are impacted. They're the ones with the rowdy business of people turning things over. So it's really important that we continue our relationship with Suffolk County Police. Okay, you have two rebuttals, one from... Can I answer the question first? Pardon me. No, uh, there's two rebuttals for Ms. Ransom. I, I need to answer the question first. No, I know, I'm because she, okay. her, the rebuttals okay. come first, and then you answer. So um, I, I ran out of time, um, but this applies as a rebuttal as well, that um, I've also, in addition to the kiosk that I'm working on, um, I am also working on potentially having uh, two of our code officers become full-time code officers. So that would help with those hours and uh, for them to work closer with Suffolk County later hours into the evening. Uh, the new technology that we have has been helping the code officers as well. Um, and, and that allows them to work more efficiently in the hours that they do work. Okay. Mayor? So this is not the first year we have the two dedicated police officers working with us here uh, during the high season. This has happened at least for the last six to seven years, Memorial Day to Labor Day. Suffolk County, due to the generosity of Legislator Hahn and the, the sixth precinct and the commissioner, have given us these two dedicated code officers. What does that mean? They do not leave this village. They work in tandem with our Code Enforcement Bureau. They actually carry the radios and they drive in the same cars. That's really important, so that way they can actually tackle what we call the hot spots in this village, which there are some, and they know them now. And unfortunately, we were supposed to not disclose the hours of operation because now everybody knows when the whiskey tour is here because we're trying to catch the bad guys. Thank you. Ms. Antrim, do you want to answer? Barbara? Do you no, want to I mean, that was public knowledge. I mean, I, I, I got okay. it from the police department, so I mean, it was not a, a hush hush secret about when their hours were working. Okay, Suzanne? Do you want to? 
So I think the original question um, speaks to the emotional and safety, emotional and physical safety and security of our young people and employees, particularly exiting their place of employments down in town after being encouraged to park on the perimeter of town, right? And to try to keep That's the, your last to one. try to keep the employees park, you know, from no, Kathy, prime parking Kathy's spaces. Sorry, I'm sorry. And then you have young people that are coming off from work late at night and being followed by people that are coming out of the bars and the, and the restaurants late. Um, and, it, it, and we need to come up with something, some type of solution to, again, restore that emotional safety and physical safety for our employees. Okay, well, you have another rebuttal. Uh, Ms. Velasquez, yeah, you, you have a rebuttal and yes. so does the mayor. Yes, thank right. you. Uh, one of the things I did to address exactly what you're speaking about is I have visited the businesses in town and I have let them know, depending on the hours, uh, this is in conjunction with our new parking lot and having their employees park on the outskirts and, and, and our new parking lot, which is further away. Um, and I've worked with our code department and our Suffolk police um, to escort, personally escort, um, the employees to their vehicles at any time, whether it be during code hours, it would be a code officer. If it's during Suffolk police uh, hours, it would be a Suffolk police police officer. They have always agreed to do that, and I do know personally some uh, employees that have done that very successfully. It makes them feel safer, um, and that's what we do. Uh, you know, we talk to the businesses, we talk to the community, we find out what they need, and we make it happen every single time. Thank you. Okay, we are very concerned about the young adults who work in the restaurants and the other establishments in this village who are going to their cars late at night. Let us not think that we are not. Uh, we have tried in the past to work and do a employee shuttle. Uh, we've tried to get that off the, you know, off the ground with the business improvement district. Uh, at that time when we were working with the parking committee, we were trying to get the, the employees to park in the employee only spots for free so that they would open up the, you know, the closer spots for the, the patrons. Unfortunately, the employee shuttle did not work. Um, it's all about the employers and helping their staff feel safe when they're leaving this village. Uh, the new parking lot on Barnum, uh, we make available free for parking. It's very well lit, and I know our friend at the Lobster House, James and his staff, and uh, Salsa Salsa and his staff are using that parking lot. We haven't heard any complaints about safety at all. Ms. Velasquez, do you want to answer? No? Okay. I think that um, the new parking lot on Barnum is, um, phenomenal it really is and but we also need to look at the other parking lots and the lighting and the safety issues that go on into the other areas where the uh, employees are parking okay we'll go on to the next question down at the end can you tell us what is planned for repairs at West Beach the stairs cement under under the blocks have floated away the grills have fallen over, and the parking spots have not been restored. Do you want to answer that, Ms. Velasquez? Yes. It's not. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is. Um, I think that one of the things that we really need to look at is what are we doing to enhance and improve all of our env environmental treasures that we have as village, um, including West Beach, um, and repairing and restoring needs to happen. These are important assets that we have in the village, um, East Beach, West Beach, we need to maintain them. That's part of our responsibility. So if we need to look for grant money, we need to do that. Um, we need to analyze and make sure that they're um, safe, that we continue to take care of them because that's why we live in this village, so that we can use these wonderful beach assets. So I don't have specific plans because I'm not in that position at the moment. But again, we have to take care of our assets here in the village. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll start with West Beach. Uh, 
Last year we had a major washout at West Beach and anything that needs to be repaired over there has to be approved by DEC. We are right now in the process of repairing the washout, which is at the bottom of the West Beach. It took up four or five parking spots. We also have repaired the walkway that goes down to the beach numerous times. The last time we did it was the week before Memorial Day. Uh, Memorial Day weekend, the entire project washed out into the sound again. So West Beach is again back on the uh, repair. If you've been down to East Beach, you can see uh, 90,000 cubic yards of sand are back on our beach. We now have a beach that we had 25 years ago that had disappeared. Mother Nature took it away. So in terms of taking care of our beaches, uh, West Beach DEC is being repaired as we speak. The stairway will be replaced again. This time we hope that it'll be a permanent repair. Good. Thank you. Uh, we, uh, we are currently seeking uh, FEMA funds, uh, 800,000 plus for the damage done during the coastal storm Isaias. Uh, we, if awarded, that money will go towards the restoration and the, uh, the permit that we just received from the DEC to restore the bluff that is, has been eroding for the last five years. We have waited three years for a DEC permit based on our plans. We need to re work and rely on these state agencies. Although we do have a DEC permit, we are still waiting for the Army Corps of Engineers to give us a permit. So these, uh, unfortunately, the coastal erosion zones are very complicated, um, but rest assured, when we have that, per, all those permits in place, we plan on going out to bid and repairing uh, the bluff this fall into next winter when, that, then when the work can be done. Do you want to speak? I pass. Oh, you pass, okay. Yeah. Ms. Ransom? I, I already spoke. Hmm. I already spoke. Okay, good. And we'll come back to you, Mr. Laux, with the next question. The village is expected to receive a considerable amount of COVID stimulus money in the coming months. Will village residents receive a tax credit since the tax cap was pierced this year? What will the money be used for? I'll be happy to answer that question. Uh, we are hoping to get a COVID stimulus package. We are currently working uh, the administrative staff, the executive team is working with NICOM, the New York State Commissioner of Mayors, to make sure that all the paperwork that the governments require has been submitted. Uh, if and when we get that money, we are going to appropriate some of that money towards the ban, the bond anticipation note that we took out. Every year, I, we, we've had a surplus. We've put that surplus towards repairing some of the infrastructure projects that have long gone neglected, like the two major retaining walls that we just had to rebuild, one at East Beach and one on Highlands Boulevard. We just are building parking lots, we're doing curbs, we're repaving streets. We were doing a fair amount of uh, brick and mortar and infrastructure repair and every single year. Um, some of that other the money will go towards some of the programs that we were not able to run last year um, because what we lost last year was all the soft money. Um, we would like to restore some of our, the programs to the level that we had them, uh, but that money will be going, 90% of it will be going back into brick and mortar. I, I would just like to add to that that uh, indirectly, yes, the money is going to go back to the taxpayers. Uh, you're getting all of these repairs. Okay. Ms. Ransom? One. I mean, if yeah. we get this COVID stimulus money, we certainly should try to enhance um, programs for our residents and, and try to assist them um, in things that were taken away. I mean, it ma makes sense. Thank you. Ms. Velasquez? Uh, you have a rebuttal, Ms. Ransom. I, I just want to emphasize that during COVID, all the essential services were maintained for the residents of this village. We maintained snow plowing. We maintained leaf and branch pickup. We maintained all the buildings were still open. What was missing were the soft programs for our seniors, our kids, um, some of the things that we do for the not-for-profits that were struggling so desperately last year. Um, so that's what I mean by replacing some of that money back in, the soft money back into the community that way. Okay. 
I would just like to add to that that um, additionally, not one single village employee had to be laid off during COVID because of the fiscal responsibility of this administration. Okay. Um, then I'll follow it up with this question. What is the key to bringing the village out of the pandemic at this moment? Which way do we start? Uh, Ms. 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 You. What is it? What's the what plan? is the key to bringing the village out of the pandemic at this time? Ms. Pulasquez. I only get one minute for this, but um, as we enter um, through through into post-pandemic times, the only constant in life is change, and we 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 are evolving, and we are going to have to come to determine what is our new normal, what um, how do we want to. Um, be proactive in coming through and and being a healthy community. And, and when I talk about healthy community, I'm talking about economic health. And we've we've all we're all on the same page that we want, you know, both our residents and our businesses and our entire community to be economically vital. Um, the emotional and physical health um, of of our residents and visitors is is key. Um, particularly our, um, for our seniors and our school age uh, children. There's a lot of um, studies and research coming out as far as the importance of addressing social isolation and how when people come, finish coming out of a pandemic, how we are going to handle the chaos that may ensue. Um, so we need to keep our community safe. For everyone thank you okay coming out of um this horrible year that we've gone all gone through i think we need to encourage new businesses to come into the village by opening up channels of communication with our property owners and people that are vested here in our community to the landlords and understand what type of commerce that could be enticed to come down into the village that would mean trying to improve our building and planning, trying to make it more streamlined, trying to make it more user friendly, so that we can encourage new businesses and have incentives so that they'll be wanting to join us here in the village of Port Jefferson. So this is a cooperative effort that you'd want to work with your chambers, Chamber of Commerce, with village government, with our business improvement district, but we all need to be able to reach out and try to entice new businesses to join us here in, in the village. Thank you. A vibrant business district is key. I think the question was what is key to coming out of this pandemic and that is a vibrant business community. People want to get out, people want to come downtown and, and, and uh, go to these businesses. We are on the right track. We make Fort Jefferson a safe and community where people want to come and people want to be. We have had, because of all of the things that we aren't doing just now, we've been doing throughout the pandemic. We have had 10 new businesses start up in the village of Port Jefferson since the, st the end of, or since COVID started. 10 new businesses, that's incredible for the, the, the small village that we are. So we are doing something right and we wanna to continue to do that. Thank you. I, I think the key was resiliency this board changed many things to help our businesses thrive through the COVID pandemic. First thing we did was change the code. We, we stopped uh, parking on Main Street so that uh, restaurants could have curbside pickup and takeout. We then did a session of Zooming with the mayor so we could teach our merchants about technology and how to survive through a pandemic when they didn't have their doors open. The next thing we did was with our open spaces, we gave every single eating and dining establishment outdoor dining opportunity. That saved, I think, 95% of our restaurants. Um, the Roush study just came out about how to get through a pandemic in downtown areas. We did everything right. And furthermore, the mixed use departments that we are building, you need to have mixed use buildings with new people living in your downtown corridors in order to support your central business districts. You need to have walkable communities and we need to support these businesses in the off season and throughout the year.
I think one of the positive things that happened throughout the pandemic were the areas that I was involved in, uh, and that was recreation, that was golf, that was tennis. We had one of the best years we've ever had. Uh, golf is an outdoor activity, tennis is an outdoor activity. We increased our membership up at the country club by over 50 members in tennis and by over 130 members in golf. The community was able to get outside when they needed to get outside. We were indoors. We were all a little bit frustrated. The outlet of the recreation program, although it was limited, we had the ice skating was super successful this year. Golf, as I said, was super successful. Tennis was successful. We were somewhat limited with what we could do here in the Village Center. The recreational programs are coming back. At this point in time, we have a load, a full load of summer pro programs, camps, tennis lessons, and so on, scheduled to take place. Thank you. Okay, as you've said, the, the country club is perhaps the village's most valuable financial asset. And this question asks, what is your position regarding the country club? And that's for everybody to answer. I probably could talk uh, the rest of the evening about the country club. I, I believe the country club is the crown jewel uh, of our village. Uh, if you have not gone up to the country club and walked around the facilities, you really don't know what you're missing. Years ago, Harold Shepro had the foresight to purchase the land that sits on that country club and the two beaches that went along with it. The country club is one of the reasons people move to this village. You talk to your realtors. That's the final nail, the country club. They want to move into the village because of the country club, the beaches, our recreational programs, our wonderful parks, and all of the people who run and support those facilities. Uh, I'm a very strong supporter of the uh, country club and uh, in times where membership was not um, at the numbers where we have it now in COVID and hopefully coming out of COVID, uh, the, the village did assist the country club in helping improve uh, facilities such as the maintenance facility, uh, the, the turn, the fitness center, and creating a card room and a brand new lobby. Uh, so we're very uh, interested in making sure that facility sustains this year. They're gonna close their fiscal year with a tremendous surplus, and they plan on paying us back, I hope. Um, <laughs> but m more importantly, we've, we've made some major changes up at the uh, facility by, by implementing a new software program uh, to make sure that when you bring a guest, you pay for your guest, and that you are not double tea, uh, booking tea times and things of that nature. And we're finding that the facility is becoming much more efficient. I applaud the new direction of the uh, director of golf, uh, Mr. Brian McMillan, for both the condition of the golf course, his leadership and supervision of the staff, and Mr. Dubin on the other side of the fence uh, with his tennis professionalism, and Renee for running all the family programs and teaching our kids lifetime recreational sports. I agree that the country club is extremely important uh, and to touch on what the mayor just ended with bringing the children to the country club and the amount of programs that we have up there for the kids has been tremendous bringing the kids in when they're young to start up a sport that they can play for a lifetime is so important it's important for the kids and when the kids come the parents follow and I think it's it's key to keeping this community vibrant for the real estate market for keeping our home values as high as they are um, it's, it's very important, and I think uh, the club is doing a fantastic job. Thank you. I think we're very fortunate to have such a wonderful asset here um, in our village, and it offers our residents a very nice recreational outlet. I'd like to bring, to have walkers come back more for golfing, and rather not insist that they have to pay golf fees for the carts. I'd like to see our senior discount come back to our golfers, which was taken away. 
But more importantly, I think we need to do a better job on the contract that we have with the current vendor there, which is the Crest Group, because right now we're only getting $20,000 a month for the rental of that facility, which is extraordinarily less than what happened when Lombardi's was there. Over, the over five years, we're going to be probably losing over $5 million because that contract has been renegotiated and renegotiated and hardly any public hearings on it. And so we have a vendor up there that's only paying $20,000 a month when, in fact, when Lombardi's had first taken it, they were initially going for $800,000 and it was, again, reduced again and reduced, reduced again. So I think we're not getting the bang for our buck out of the country club, and we really need to look into that. Um, um, you have a rebuttal from Mr. Lowe. I, I have a couple of rebuttals. Uh, the sixth the, the first rebuttal is... How many rebuttals are you allowed, please? Five. And, how, and are we keeping track of the rebuttals, please? Pardon yeah, me? I'm, I'm I think this was my now. second one. Uh, in reference to the senior citizen, no, sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> she's always picking on me. <laughs> in reference to the senior citizen discount, uh, we ch we tried very hard this year to keep our membership rates at a reasonable level. We brought in all of these new members, and they're younger members. Uh, I hate to say it, but our country club uh, in the past few years has become aged. Um, we are focusing on younger members. The senior citizen discount cost us $21,000. That money is better used to maintain a lower membership rate to bring in more members. As far as the rental of the facility is concerned, we have a renter. The place was empty. No one wanted to go up there. The $20,000 per month goes directly to the village. And I just want to throw one other little fact in there. The village residents pay absolutely no tax money to support that country club. Zero. It is a self-sustaining country club. As Margo had mentioned, you can pick this up. My time is up. You can pick it up. You know where I'm going. Do you have a rebuttal? No, because Ms. Ransom wants to speak. It might be self-sustaining now, but it certainly hasn't in the, in the past. And I think that the village didn't do a good job in, in, in looking into that contract. Um, why are we? Why? Why can't people walk on that golf course? I, I'm not. I'm not. I don't understand. For if, if it's all about revenue, let them pay a reduced fee for walking. If if, if that's what it comes down to, why can't we have a hundred dollar discount for our seniors? They are valued in our community as well. I just think it's nickel and diming constantly, and I think that the golfers are not, uh, not appreciative of it. Okay. I just, okay. I have to, I have okay. to. Okay, continue. <laughs> I think 150 new members speaks for itself. Uh, we hit 700 members today. That is a lot of golf members. Thank you. Okay. Okay, the next question. Um, can I answer the question? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so mm -hmm. the question I think was about uh, the thoughts on the, the country club. And um, I think that there's a level of exclusivity that is um, brought on when we talk about the, this uh, and associated as like a private club. The, um, instead of realizing it as a fee-based asset for all of our residents and all of the people that live in the village, um, and I think that you know we're offering golf and tennis there, and I think that the, we we should again look at what are 
recreational opportunities that are responsive to all of the residents and not just a you know a limited slice of of people that um, favor two sports but look at you know what what recreational opportunities can we offer to all of the residents utilizing the this asset that is the largest village owned property um, in our village. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You have another rebuttal from Mr. Loud. Is this my last one? Um, no. Okay. You have three. This is three. Any resident, and for that, for that matter, any non-resident can go up to the country club at any time, book a lesson in tennis, book a lesson in golf, buy a six-play pass to try the golf course, buy a range pass to try the driving range, go into our fitness center, go into our turn. It's open to everyone. However, there is a price to pay. It's not, we don't have free movies. If you want to play golf or tennis or take a lesson, there's always a fee connected to it. But it is open to anyone who wants to go up there and use the facility. Thank you. Ms. Velasquez, you want to answer him? No? Okay. Again, I think uh, that we as a village and a community, we need to look at what are responsive, healthy, recreational outlets for all the segments of our community residents um, from young to the, those that are aging in place. And, you know, I think the, the golf and tennis and, and the country club is fine for that segment of, of our population, but we need to look at how can we respond and provide healthy recreational outlets for those that don't particularly favor golf and tennis. Okay, thank you. Okay, now we begin with, with you this time, right? Did I lose, get, lose track? Yes. Okay. The question is, um, what are the challenges to uptown development? What re infrastructure tool could, you mar could help you marry uptown with downtown neighborhoods? And we'll start at the end there. So uh, the... Um, upper end of our main street is the gateway to into our village and we do need to redevelop and um, revitalize that portion of our town um, there are challenges um, just even between um, well uh, I, there's there's a lot of challenges based on um, whether or not uh, people are, in, who is in wanting to invest into um, those properties. We are, there's a lot of projects that are in place and so it is being redeveloped and um, I think that the, there's more positivity. We have a transportation hub at both ends of our, our main street, um, which helps, should help, um, redevelop upper port. I think that we need to include uh, residential service-based commerce um, businesses up there more so than downtown. Certainly some of the development that's happening in upper port right now is, is great. Affordable housing is important for our community. There are other projects that are planned that will also increase the energy level in upper port. I think we, we need to try to reach out and find more commerce that is basically trying to bring more services to Upper Port, which is what it used to be. We need to tie in Upper to Lower. Um, we talked about community gardens that are going to be in Upper Port that would bring people there and out and then having community gardens down here. I think that's a nice connection. We have a medical campus up there that we need to um, embrace better. There's certainly parking for all of this. We have the intermodal transportation with a railroad. So we need to work with our um, 
landlords there and to see and sit around uh, around a table and find out what would be the best things for um, development and redevelopment for suburban renewal. Thank you. I'll answer the part about uh, the connection between uptown and downtown. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I have found in talking to residents of the uh, apartments that are already established is that there are many, many, many people who will come into the Port Jefferson because of the apartments. They fall in love and they buy a home and they stay and they raise their children. So to me, a tie-in is you, know, you bring people uptown in the new apartments because of all of the great things we have downtown, the programs here for all ages here at the uh, Village Center, the programs at the Country Club, the people stay and they visit downtown. As liaison to parking and transportation, one of the things that um, I've been talking about and taking steps uh, toward as we develop uptown or as uptown develops is uh, possibly a uh, bike share program, bicycle share. Uh, we looked into that. We met with some companies. Um, but of course, the hills are very challenging for any type of a, a bicycle uh, commute. Getting back home, coming into town is great, but they need to get back home. Uh, so there are new electric bicycles. There's a new shop down in East Setauket, um, and there are uh, bicycle share companies that, that specialize in the electric bicycles. Um, I would love to be able to install those at the train station and downtown. Thank you. I, I think the question was the challenges with redeveloping Upper Port. Mm -hmm. So the challenge, the biggest challenge with redeveloping Upper Port is the lot sizes. You have a historic district where the lot sizes are very, very small. In the C2 and C1 districts, the, the property can be built lot line to lot line. Uh, it takes a long time for a developer to buy up the number of properties that they need to, what I describe as create the critical mass, or to get the footprint that they need to then take the buildings down and rebuild. The math has to work, the rate of return has to work, and the incentives have to work. The master plan and the revitalization plan calls for incentives. You can get a fourth story, you have to give us back an amenity, and you can then add density to your project without getting uh, you know, outside of our density limitations pursuant to the code. Also, electrification of the train station is something, again, Bruce Miller and I are working on with the Long Island Railroad and the MTA. Imagine if you could take the train from Port Jefferson and get into Manhattan in less than an hour. I think people would, the ridership would be up and people would be coming back to take the train in Port Jeff Station. I think most of what we're talking about has been touched upon. The, the one thing that comes to my mind with the development uptown, there are so many different owners uh, of these buildings. Uh, they may be owned by a single person, by a corporation. They may be owned by a bank or two banks. In order for a developer to get in there and get things done, it it's, takes a little time, it takes a little magic to bring all of these factions together. Uh, we have started on the one side. If you've been up there, the bulldozer went to work. Margot knocked down the first building. Uh, she promised me that I could knock down the second building when that happens. Uh, we do have a master plan in place. It's been in place for years, and we're going to try to stick to it. Okay, thank you. Okay, next question. It's related. There's a perception in the community that dealing with the planning committee is excessively challenging with delays and poor communications. It seems to be getting worse. What can be done? And we start with Mr. Lowes. So it's a shame we just asked this question because the chair of the, build, the planning department just left the building. Oh. Is, that, is that timed? Okay. So, <laughs> The building and planning department works very hard. They get applications for all sorts of things, from tree clearing, from sign permits, for decks to be built, uh, for pools to be put in, for extensions to be on homes, and to, for your business to be renovated on the interior, and also for these larger projects to come along. I think we have five full-time staff. We have one planner and, and a half. Uh, we, have one, we have now two building inspectors. We brought on an additional building inspector. There's no doubt the process could be made easier and streamlined. What we need from help from is for the applications as submitted to be complete. And what does that mean? The, p the plan cannot be reviewed unless all the paperwork is in. So if a document is missing, you may get a call saying we need your updated, whatever, electrical underwriter certificate. Um, we are busy 
Everybody's staying home, and guess what they're doing? They're putting in pools. They're building on additions to their homes. They're adding she sheds to their backyards. Joan, that was for you. Uh, so, you know, we, we understand. Can you repeat the question? Um, please. Yes. OK. Um, hold on. I, ha I should hang on to these things. Um. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, there was a little. There is a perception in the community that dealing with the planning committee is excessively challenging with delays and poor communications. It seems to be getting worse. What can be done? I think one of the things that can be done uh, to rectify the problem of delays is to uh, look at the initial uh, intake process. Um, and I think that can be definitely more streamlined. Um, and if that means bringing in another employee dedicated to just uh, having a 24 to 48 hour turnaround on exactly uh, what might be missing uh, from that application, um, I, I think you know, I'd be on board with looking into that for sure. Mm -hmm. um, as the mayor said, and I'll, I'll uh, agree with her uh, wholeheartedly, is that I don't think they've ever been busier with the redevelopment going on uptown with everybody being home and doing all of the construction, you know that if you've tried to hire a contractor lately for anything, they are busy. Um, you know, those per that permit process um, is, is, is there and in place. It could be more streamlined, um, but you know, that building and planning department works extremely hard to get uh, everybody's permits done, uptown, downtown, residential. Um, but I'm definitely willing to take a look at something that, that may or may not be broken, that you know, if it's perceived to be broken, that's your perception and that's your reality, and, and uh, you know, I'm willing to help fix that. Okay, so we're all busy, I get it. But this problem with the building and planning department has been going on for years. It's not a perception, it is the reality. There should be easy process, user-friendly ways of dealing with our building and planning department. There should be a checklist. You come in, this is what you have to do, you bring it back, and it's done. People can make mistakes, maybe they don't put in all the right paperwork, but when you given a list and you follow everything on the list and you submit everything and then the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing and then the people come in they say well now you need this or now you need that it's just not easy and the time frame has to be much quicker you can't have an active application and you have to wait yet another month for when the planning board meets or another month and it gets delayed and delayed in the meantime people aren't able to move forward with their projects I understand we're busy. I just think there can be a lot better job. This has been an ongoing problem for as long as I've been here in the village. Streamlined ease and equity. Let's go on to the next question. Okay. <laughs> All right. And you get the next question um, about the, the gap. What is being done about the gap parking lot? Is there any action with the Gap building? Could we get a grocer like Trader Joe's or at least a good deli? And then the other part of that question is, could parking meters be changed to accept credit cards? I had a little. <laughs> parking meters. I was struggling with the parking meter down there. I don't know how to do it with my phone. Was that so your question, whoever. Nancy? OK. Um, so um, I know that my colleagues are going to have more to say about the, the gap, but I think that, again, we need to be looking at what can go into that space that's been empty because of the high rents that are available. We need to um, speak, sit down and speak with the landlords, with the um, with the constituents to see what is it that can be brought in there to best serve both um, residents and our visitors. Um, there's, it's great space. We, we should be able to, again, leverage that. The parking lot should definitely be reconfigured um, and cleaned up. It, it, it's, it's, does not look nice back there. It's the center of our village. It's uh, our, our footprint. It is. It, it's 
ugly. I'd like to beautify the, that area and reconfigure it to um, be utilized more appropriately, particularly for the, the residential lot that's in there. The monies that are collected through the fines for, for parking and et cetera are going into a dedicated fund. The parking committee a number of years ago have asked for that particular parking lot to be relayed out and redone. We need to move forward with that. Um, we put a lot of energy into the Barnum lot, but if we were able to take that parking lot and restructure it, relay it out, we'll get a higher yield with parking um, for that back area. The gap, um, I've had communications with the real estate people there. We need to sit down and really understand what they need so that we can get um, a formidable tenant or tenants into that building. These are iconic locations that um, are in the middle of our village, including where the old Village Way is, the McDonald's, all of these major locations. We need to work in and try to talk to these people and see what would be best that it would be beneficial to both our residents and the visitors here in, in the village. So um, I'd like to be able to move forward with that. Okay. Uh, I'm glad that uh, Barbara and Suzanne brought up the gap parking lot because one of the first things that I did with the parking committee is we had a uh, study done on that on that parking lot. It's a very challenging lot. Um, there are options and that is something that we're currently working on. Um, as far as the gap itself, I know there have been uh, different um, companies looking at it. Um, one of them uh, was a grocery store, um, but the space just didn't fit along with the parking restrictions. One of the things that I've been thinking about and, um, and throwing out there as an idea, and it's just an idea at this point, but I would like the village to explore purchasing that property. I'd like to knock down the building and build a beautiful park, a town square of sorts to have permanent uh, picnic tables, dining tables for people to get some takeout or just their coffee, to hang out and to people watch, um, to have a place where uh, you know acoustic mus musicians they're not, don't have to be on the sidewalk, they could sit there and, and uh, enjoy this beautiful village that we have. Now again, it's just an idea. Um, we don't own the property. We have already spoken to tenants, um, you know, when they, when they want to come to us, if a code change is needed, we're always willing to do a code change to, to get people in there. The rent is extremely high at $37,000 a month. It's a challenging uh, property. Thank you. Okay. So yes, they're asking $37,000 a month rent for the building and it's 16,000 square feet. Uh, they could not find one tenant for the building. We did uh, sit with IGA, the uh, small grocer, on uh, several occasions. They tried to rent it, and then they tried to buy it, and they could not strike a deal. Uh, we, at that time, uh, have a map, and we have studied the Gap parking lot. We did a study with VHB Engineering. Uh, we, uh, in refiguring, reconfiguring the lot, unfortunately, we don't yield uh, more than one or two spaces, uh, believe it or not. So we have been waiting on redoing that lot until we understand or who's coming into that building because the use of that lot is integral to that building. Um, the parking fines do not go into the uh, parking managed fund. The parking meter fees go into the parking managed fund. So when somebody pays a ticket for overtime parking that comes to the village's account and the village's budget. When you pay the meter, it goes into a secure account to refurbish our parking lots, lighting, cameras, everything. Uh, so you folks have not had to pay for the re refurbishment or renovation of a parking lot in I think 14 or 16 years. That money all comes from managed parking. I think if that building remains the way it is and the situation remains the way it is, uh, it's never going to be occupied. Uh, perhaps a solution would be to subdivide the building. I like the idea maybe of tearing it down. I can get behind the bulldozer. Um, $37,000 a month is an exorbitant price to charge for that building. The only solution would be perhaps to subdivide the building, break it into smaller retail stores, and then go along with the reconfiguration of the parking lot like a grocery store. Sorry? I said like a grocery store. We could use a grocery store downtown. 
I miss uh, Gristides. I don't know how many people remember right. Gristides, yeah. but. Yes. Okay, next question starts with Mr. Lux. What are the plans or thoughts about the Lawrence Avi Aviation Site? Well, the Lawrence Aviation Site is, number one, not in Port Jefferson. Mm. However, we all know that it's a massive cleanup job to clean up that area. There are talks, there have been talks about uh, if the train electrifies and the train station moves to the western side of Route 112, which we would all love, that perhaps that area, once it were cleaned up, could become a turnaround area for the electrified trains. Um, I know Margo has, and I think Bruce Miller has also worked on this. It would be a very, very expensive proposition if the village were to mm -hmm. try to take that over. Uh, so the county right now is working with the federal government as Lawrence Aviation is a super fun cleanup site. Uh, we had a uh, company there that dumped toxic barrels uh, that infiltrated our, our water systems. Uh, first thing I did when I became mayor 12 years ago is I worked with the EPA and we built the, uh, the little green building and the ball field. That's a wastewater treatment facility. It's sucking the toxins out of the water table, recycling it, cleaning it, and putting the affluent water back into the system. When it's clean, that building is dedicated back to the village for recreational use. Right now, the county is looking to foreclose for back taxes, work hand in hand with the federal government, and the plan is to use that location for the electric car yard when the line gets electrified, that's a tongue twister, uh, there will be hopefully a public uh, park component. We're also looking for a solar panel farm, uh, but we are, it's in the hands of the county, in very good hands with the county, and uh, we are on board with that plan. Anything to add? The Suffolk County Land Bank Corporation um, is looking into this. It's, we have 125 acres up there, and although it's not in the village of Port Jefferson, we should be very much engaged in what happens to that property because it directly will affect the residents. Yes, open space, the um, new Long Island Railroad electrification is very important, and that would be moving our Port Jefferson branch um, into the future. They're also talking about actually moving um, the, where the regular railroad station is right now onto that property. Mm -hmm. So we do need to stay engaged um, with these uh, particular talks because it will affect um, the quality of life um, here for our residents. Mm -hmm. Ditto, Barbara. Um, I think we do still need to continue working with the EPA, look at um, how that can be utilized to, for the renewable energies, um, looking at it for park recreational opportunities, green trails, um, everything. Okay. All right. And maybe this is the last question. Do you think vacancies on the board should be announced in time for people to get petitions and mount a campaign? So we'll start with Mr. Velasquez. Can you repeat What's the that? Question? Maybe the answer is yes, I don't know. <laughs> Should I read it again? Yes. Yes. Okay, Ob obviously somebody <laughs> has a question. Do you think vacancies on the board should be announced in time for people to get petitions and mount a campaign? So the answer should be yes. <laughs> th th that's our democratic political process is that they are announced and okay. people get petitions. Well, obviously somebody had a problem on with time. it. <laughs> Can we have another question? Yes. And is entitled to ask the question, so. Can you repeat it again? <laughs> All right, so, so yes, I think, you know, it is our democratic political process that everybody should have the opportunity to um, run f and campaign for an opening on any board and elected office in any level of our government. Um, it, I mean, I suppose it could be beneficial for um, the 
terms and and processes to be advertised more regularly or something? I'm not well, sure. Well, I'm assuming that everybody on the board felt that it was done in time. Correct. Uh, oh, oh, hmm? we're, we're here. Yeah. <laughs> I could But somebody I'd like else to, isn't. <laughs> I'd like to say that, you know, a Village Hall is, is, you know, we have an open door policy there. Uh, the mayor's door is always open. Um, I always give out my information for people to contact me. Anybody that wants to get involved okay. uh, can come in and say, I want to get involved and, you know, we'll give you any inf all the information possible. When, when I knew I be wanted to become involved in, in the village in some way um, and, and chose village government, I uh, called up the mayor and I said, I want to come talk to you. And I walked in and she helped, you know, put, guide me in the right direction to find the information. Okay. It's there. Um, so I believe it's yes, that's, that's and good it's there. That's to, to yes. somebody. And it is 20 after 8, so we'll, go, we'll move to closing statements. And we'll start with, uh, let me think, how did we do this? <laughs> we start with the mayor. So I think I go first. And then, and then we'll do both mayors, and then we'll do the now trustees. Two minutes. Two, two minutes. All right. I thought we did the uh, trustees first, and then. Pardon me? Did, the don't we do the trustees first and then I, I can't the hear mayors? you. Is it don't we do the trustee? We did the mayors and then the trustees, and yes. then we close with the trustees and then the mayor candidates. We could do that, but we're not okay. doing that. <laughs> we, aren't re we aren't reversing the whole thing. We're reversing the order of people. Okay. So Suzanne okay. should go first because she went home last. Yes. I'll okay. go first. <laughs> Okay. <coughs> so this is the closing, the closing? Yes. Okay. I want to move our legacy forward. My experience is ideal for both embracing opportunities and addressing the challenges that lie ahead for our Port Jefferson Village. Being both visionary and detail oriented, I thrive in working effectively on macro and micro issues, and I understand the importance of including multiple perspectives in discussion and decision making. My professional experience is grounded in creating safe, healthy environments and providing effective and equitable service delivery. I am a competent leader who works well with others, adept at forming and maintaining positive, collaborative relationships with people in all segments of our communities on and beyond Main Street. From me, you can count on fairness, impartiality, transparency, good and ethical governance and civility. We may disagree at times, but as anyone who has worked with me knows, I am at all times respectful of others' opinions and strive to model the very best of civil discourse and work towards fair resolutions. So I'm asking for you to join us in answering the call for change and vote Row B, the Alliance for All team, Barbara Ransom for mayor, and Dr. Suzanne Velasquez for trustee on June 15th. Thank you. Okay, so why don't, why don't we continue with the trustees and then the mayors can go last and be the final say. Thank you. Tonight I've discussed how I've dedicated my last two years as trustee to making Port Jefferson the place you want to live, work, and raise your children. I've increased the be a, a better quality of life uptown with the train station more increased uh, communication with our e-report and social media, answering people's questions real time. I've started a bicycle task force to help with, <clears throat> with our quality of life in downtown Port Jeff with the businesses and help to change the code to impound those bicycles and keep everyone safe. I plan to continue that path with even more ideas like installing a constable kiosk on Main Street and increasing hours of code officers, possibly to full time. I thank you all for your support, your time in coming here tonight, and to the League of Women Voters for hosting tonight. I ask you for the opportunity to continue my work as your voice and your trustee. Please vote for me and my colleagues, Mayor Garant and Trustee Laux. Thank you. First, I want to thank everyone for showing up this evening. I want to thank the League for 
sponsoring this event. I think it was very well done. I have been a trustee here now for six years. It is a full-time job for me. I am retired. I do nothing else but work as your trustee. I am a li liaison to the, or have been a liaison to the Parks Department. I'm presently the liaison to the Village Center, a liaison to the Recreation Department, a liaison to the Country Club. We've talked extensively t this evening about these different areas. Some of the things that we've accomplished in the last six years, we built a state-of-the-art maintenance building at the Country Club. We refurbished and built the turn at the club. We put a fitness center in at the club. We brought back our beaches. We're still working on our beaches. I want to continue as a trustee so that we can complete these projects. I think they're very, very important to the entire community. I love this village. I love what I'm doing. I work constantly for the village. My wife will attest to that. I have 30 seconds left. <laughs> I leave in the morning to make my rounds. She calls it my rounds. I tell her I'll be right back. Three or four hours later, I return. I want to continue doing that because I enjoy it. This village is a wonderful village. Okay, we'll move on to Mayor Grant. Thank you everyone for putting up with this this evening and staying with us for the course in the League of Women Voters for the organization and for the uh, initiative. For those who don't know my background, I'm an attorney with a private practice here on Port Jefferson on East Main Street. I received my bachelor's in science from Lehigh University, U University majoring in finance, economics, and urban planning, and graduated from Port Chippewa in 1982. I have worked alongside every committee, board, and not-for-profit in this village. I have partnered with our local and statewide elected officials on initiatives both large and small. I have chaired and attended over 270 Board of Trustees meetings. I have been elect elected your mayor six times, and I thank you for entrusting me over those years, and I am pleased, and I, uh, pleased to know I take great pride in, in my service to you. Yes, there is work to do. There will always be work to do. The Unity team has never shied away from any challenge and has stepped up every time. No matter if it's suing National Grid in federal court, or approving an Eagle Scout project that will brand Port Jefferson on Instagram, we are on the job, we are approachable, and we are accountable to you. Another two years will bring us closer to three or four more shovels in the ground in Upper Port. It will determine the course of electrification of the rail line and possibly the future of our power plant. Building our assessment role to stabilize our tax base promises an affordable future and an alternative choice for safe and walkable housing that supports our central business districts in both Upper and Lower Port. Our parks are beautiful, our parks are sleek and modern, parking lots are sleek and modern. I'm gonna skip down to my next paragraph, she's not gonna give me time. <laughs> Team Unity will maintain and foster our working relationships with our village partners on all levels. We will build new bridges every single day. We will embrace those who volunteer to help and welcome new energy, new ideas, and those who wanna work productively and not tear us apart or down. I am the candidate for mayor. I'm the better qualified with the right disposition who will keep us on track together I am your mayor, I remain Port Jeff proud, and Port Jeff strong. Thank you, thank you for the League of Women Voters for tonight. Um, a lot of information was given tonight, but what I hope you take away with is that we need a, ta we need a time for change, term limitations, I've been actively involved with our village for decades, and I want to continue in a higher capacity as your mayor. Those that do know me will confess my diligence and fairness. My approach is to the point, no nonsense, in getting things done. My promise to you, the residents, is my work ethic is sincere, and I'll be my, do my very best to represent you. I will be your full-time mayor. 
We seem to have gotten away with the micro-ness of helping our village residents. We've gotten more macro, and I think it's important that we need to bring that back to the residents' level. I am more than just your neighbor, and I want to be your elected public servant. So please, on June 15th, vote row B, Alliance for All, answering the call, Suzanne and Barb. I just want to thank all the candidates. I thought you were very pleasant, cooperative, interesting, and I hope you will all win, but you can't. <laughs> and, and thank you for having it in this building, which was very nice, and thank you for your help with the... With the and I, I also want to thank the league, thank you to the the, sound the man. league members who came to help with the... With this, with the, the, the